Today I want to talk practical spirituality and I want to narrow in on a particular attitude, a particular way of living out our faith which radically impacts and transforms our life. Now I'm conscious that this homily today is not one of those warm and fuzzy Jesus loves you kind of homilies. I mean you know Jesus loves you right? Uh, but this is not one of those. Uh, it's a little more gritty. You're going to be all right with that? Yeah? You'd be fine. Um, I've given this homily the title, It's On Me. It's On Me. Just so I know you're with me, can you do me a favour? Turn to the person next to you and, like, you really mean it, say to them, it's on me. It's on me. It's on me. Good. No, no, no not it's on you, it's on me. It's on me. Yeah. Yeah, good, me. <laughs> All right, let's, uh, let's start with our first reading. In fact, that's where we're going to kind of really focus today, from the first book of the Bible, that Genesis story, which opens up for us some profound truths about God, about ourselves, about the world, uh, about the deeper meaning and purpose of our lives. And today we pick up the story soon after Adam had eaten from that forbidden tree. And I want you to notice... As soon as he'd made that mistake, the dialogue starts with God. You see, he's the kind of father who always wants to be with his children, even when they mess up. And so he calls after Adam. He says, where are you? And Adam, I don't know, probably behind a tree somewhere or in, the, in a cave, he responds. He says, oh, I was afraid and naked, so I hid. Adam was feeling shame. And one of the reasons shame can cause all kinds of problems in our life is because it often causes us to hide. To hide from ourselves. To hide from others. And, and much more um, uh, importantly, or problematically, to hide from God. Which is what Adam was doing. And so God says, have you been eating of the tree that I forbade you to eat? God knew he ate from the tree, right? But I think he was just giving Adam an opportunity to say, well, I confess, it's on me, it's on me. And, of course, that's what Adam did, right? He said, yeah, oh, look, God, I'm sorry, I stuffed up. I was so hungry, and that fruit looked so good, I just could not help myself. Adam said that, didn't he? <laughs> what did Adam say? It wasn't me. It's not on me. It's on her. She told me to eat it. And so God says to Eve, what is this that you have done? And Eve says, it's not on me. It's on the serpent. He tempted me, that little rascal. And so I ate. Have you ever found yourself putting the responsibility for your circumstances or your attitudes or your behaviours on someone else or something else? Anyone? Any takers? No? Just me. Thank you, Anthony. (laughs) Thank you for your honesty. Maybe your parents. I'm this way because of my parents. Or my boss or my spouse, my children, my neighbour. The politicians, those politicians. <laughs> Maybe the Pope? God? This seems to be one of our core coping mechanisms as humans, this tendency to blame others for our experience of life. And it's something which we probably often do unconsciously. We don't even realise we're doing it. It's almost like there is a part of us that is always looking for reasons why we can't be the kind of people we want to be, why we can't achieve the things that deep down we want to achieve. Always looking for people or for situations to blame. We want to put the responsibility out there, yeah? I want to suggest the real issue in this Genesis story is not so much the disobedience of Adam and Eve, not not the fact that they ate the fruit, but it was their failure to own it, to own their behaviour. 
Now, of course, sometimes other people or other situations do actually make life difficult for us, yeah? Sometimes life is deeply unfair. But my key point today is that we can and we should still take responsibility for all of the circumstances of our life, everything that we're experiencing. Those situations that are our fault and the ones that aren't our fault. The ones that are fair and the ones that are unfair. And that doesn't mean that we take the blame for them, yeah? It's not the same thing I'm talking about here. It doesn't mean that uh, we need to deny the injustice that we have experienced. And it also doesn't mean we need to fix these situations. Taking responsibility means taking ownership for how we will respond to whatever it is we're experiencing. It means choosing how we will think about it, what we will do about it. Remember that shocking teaching of Jesus? He says, if someone slaps you on the right cheek, turn the other cheek. I don't think Jesus was saying, look, you you need to be glutton for punishment, just let them lay it on you, right? That's not what he was saying. I think his point is that you can choose to respond you can choose to take ownership, to be, uh, take responsibility over any situation. You can respond according to your values rather than reacting according to your experiences, which is, which is what we tend to do, right? You slap me, I'll slap you double as hard. <laughs> Taking responsibility for our lives means deciding to be part of the solution, which is quite the opposite to pointing the finger, to blaming. Sometimes we don't want to do that, though, right? Sometimes we don't want to take responsibility because it means that we are on the hook. It means that we are accountable for how our life turns out. If we play the victim, then it's always someone else's fault if my life doesn't turn out how I want it to turn out. But if we take responsibility, suddenly I'm accountable. Or sometimes we play the victim as a way of taking revenge on someone that has hurt us. We, we make them pay for our unhappy lives by kind of just, you know, letting life be done to us. We're kind of funny how we operate sometimes, right? But whenever we, take, whenever we fail to take responsibility, we are ultimately the ones that suffer because we, we are giving our power away. We surrender our lives to our circumstances or to other people. And over time, that tends to make us feel helpless. And when we're helpless, we tend to get cynical and we get angry. We get bitter. We become shameful and, 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 and we start to hide from our life, just like Adam was hiding in the garden. It's kind of a bit heavy, isn't it? But there is good news, right? You want the good news? Here it is. The good news is that we all have the capacity to take responsibility for our lives. And thank God it's not really dependent on us. Listen to St. Paul. He's uh, writing to the Philippians and he's sharing about his own suffering, right? He had like pretty tremendous suffering and a lot of it was unfair. Uh, Here's what he says. I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation. He's saying, I can own whatever I'm experiencing. And I can do all this. I can always say it's on me because of him who gives me strength. The reason we can always take responsibility is because of the presence of Christ within us. If you ask for it, and if you trust it, God will give you the faith. He will give you the strength to take ownership of your life, regardless of what you're facing. Yeah, He will help you to get on the front foot, rather than being passive and stagnant. He will enable you to say in the midst of any circumstance that, I might not like it, I might not think it's fair, but Lord, this one is on me too. Because I believe that you're all powerful, you're all good, that you are faithful. 
I believe that whatever I take ownership of, you will heal, you will redeem, and you will use for my good. And so, Lord, show me. Show me how I can take responsibility for this this situation which I think is unfair or this failure of mine. Show me how I can see that through the lens of faith and hope and love. Show me how I can get on the front foot, how I can own it. As if you really exist, you really do live within me. You really can do something about it. Many of you have probably heard the story of Corey Ten Boom. She lived in a Dutch family uh, who were hiding Jews at the time of the Nazi occupation. And it was said that they saved over 800 Jewish lives. But eventually they were caught and uh, Corey was sent to the Ravensbrück concentration camp with her sister Betsy who died there. Corey survived and, and many years later she was giving a, a public talk about the power of forgiveness. And, and after the talk she noticed this man approaching her and she said that as soon as she saw him she immediately tensed up because she recognised him as one of the guards from the, the concentration camp. When he approached her, he thanked her for her talk and he says, he said, I was a guard at Ravensbrook and um, I was so glad to hear you talking about God's forgiveness. I've become a Christian myself now and, and I know that God has forgiven me for all of the cruel things I did there, but I want to hear it from your lips too. And so he lifts his hand to her and he says, will you forgive me? Corey said that at that moment, all of her traumatic memories started to flood back. Um, She remembered the cruelty that her and her sister uh, endured at that place. And she remembered walking past this guard naked and and the shame that she felt. And she said that in that moment, she was before him, she could not find anything within her that wanted to forgive him. Nothing. And so she prayed, just in her heart, she prayed. She said, said, Jesus... um, Help me at least to lift my hand to his. You know, at least I can do that. Give me the sensation. Give me the feeling. And, and, and that's what she did. Here's what, here's what she said. Woodenly, mechanically, I thrust my hand into his. And as I did that, an incredible thing took place. A current started in my shoulder, raced down my arm, and sprang into our joined hands. And then this healing warmth seemed to flood my whole being, bringing tears to my eyes. And I said to him, I forgive you, brother, with all of my heart. She said that she had never known God's love so intensely as she did in that moment. It was a moment that radically impacted and and changed her whole life. Here's my point in sharing the story of Corey. She had every reason to blame, didn't she? She had every reason to play the victim, to avoid taking responsibility. But instead, she said, it's on me. I'm taking responsibility for this. Taking responsibility gives God permission to be God in our lives. To forgive, to heal, to liberate, to transform, to to lead us into a life we we never imagined possible. It doesn't only bring spiritual benefits, though. It benefits us on so many levels. The psychologists talk about the importance of taking responsibility. Here's some things they say. It increases psychological well-being. It enhances our resilience. It enhances our problem-solving skills. It boosts our motivation. And most importantly... It improves our relationships. If you want to develop this practical way of living out your faith, I want to suggest that you just start with small steps. Start by noticing the situations in your life where you avoid taking responsibility, where you find yourself complaining, uh, pointing the finger, blaming, making excuses. Maybe it's in a particular relationship. Maybe it's a thought or a behaviour that you struggle with. Maybe it's, a, um, maybe it's a dream 
that you've always wanted to go after, but you've just, you know, you've never really been able to pursue it. When you notice any area, any situation in your life where you are avoiding taking responsibility, I want you to remind yourself that you have the power to choose because you have Christ in you. You have the ability in any situation, in any moment to say, this is on me. And you don't need to feel it. You just you move it in faith, yeah? This is on me. I'm letting go of the blaming and the complaining. I'm taking responsibility for this. I'm taking ownership of my life. And then think about one practical thing you can do to actually take responsibility in that situation. Ask yourself, how can I work with God and contribute towards the healing and the transformation of this circumstance, this behaviour, this situation in my life? 